because my message tomorrow night is much better than the one tonight. <laughs> but you're already here, so stay now. But tomorrow night, that's the night you want to come. We'll look for you back tomorrow night. Thank you again so very, very much. We're talking tonight about the image and the impact of the earliest churches of the Book of Acts. Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about the maturing of the earliest churches of the Book of Acts, the image and impact of the church as they matured as Christians. You know, when they came to know the Lord, and on that wonderful day of Pentecost, they were brand new baby believers. But as you progress through the book of Acts, they become a mighty force. They become a, a people of God to be reckoned with. What is it that caused them to have such an impact on their society? Well, whatever it is, we want it to be true for our society as well. And last night, we spent some time taking pictures of the first century church. And I also took some pictures of those of you in the audience last night. If you were here, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I sent all of those pictures back to America, to the NSA in America. <laughs> By the end of the week, you should all be wiretapped and spied on and all terrible things happening to you. But tonight, I want us just to think about what the society is like here and now in the 21st century. And I'm going to spend a few minutes before I get to the text tonight just to describe the way the world is. Now, you live in that world, and you already know the way the world is. But I want us to think together, because this is Keswick. We are all in one in Christ. I want us to think together about the world that we are attempting to win for the Lord Jesus tonight. You know, the earliest churches faced a world that had not yet experienced the benefits of Christianity. It was a world that knew nothing about what Christianity could do for the world. On the other hand, we live in a world today that has already experienced the benefits of Christianity and, for the most part, has rejected those benefits. We've turned our back on much of what we believe to be true even 50 years ago. We've become a society of people who do not have God at the center of their lives. We become a wicked society, a society filled with violence, a society filled with immorality, a society that looks like Christianity has not ever had any impact on it. Now, I'm speaking in generalities, of course, but what I want you to see tonight is where we are in the flow of history and what you and I are up against if we are going to have the impact on our world the way the first century churches had an impact on their world. You probably have heard of the word postmodernism. It's all the buzz these days. It used to be when I was in college, we had two kinds of worlds, the ancient world and the modern world. Ancient world was, well, my parents. The modern world was me. Now, the ancient world was the Greeks and the Romans and, you know, the Assyrians. And, and the modern world was, um, well, you know, since the First World War, something like that. Now today, historians are dividing the world differently from the way when I was in college. There are three major divisions of history, according to the history books today. They are these. Number one, there is the pre-modern world. Pre-modern. The pre-modern world is a world in which uh, Western civilization, your civilization and mine, was God-centered. It was a civilization in which it was Bible-based. Even people who didn't believe the Bible could quote it. 
They knew what it said. That's the pre-modern world. We don't live in that world anymore. The second division of history is called the modern world. From the time of the Renaissance onward, the modern world has gotten rid of the Bible base and gotten rid of the God-centeredness of society, and in its place, they've placed man. So today, in the modern world, naturalism has replaced a belief in the creation of God. It is a science-based world, not a Bible based world. While I was in college and in graduate school, the whole debate about creation versus evolution really heated up. And it's been raging for uh, 50 years or more, but it really heated up in those days because there used to be Christians on one side of the issue and ungodly people on the other side of the issue, and then suddenly it all began to blend together. And you couldn't tell who was who. That was the modern world. Friends, we do not live in the pre-modern world. We don't even live in the modern world. We live in the post-modern world. Now let me explain what the post-modern world is like. In a post-modern world, people want to be spiritual. They just don't want to be religious. They want to know God, but they want to make their own God that they know. They like spiritual things, but they want to pick and choose from Buddhism and Hinduism and Christianity and naturalism. They want to make their own religion and be their own God. That's the postmodern world. And I don't know if you've looked around you, but that's the world you live in tonight. That's the world we all live in tonight. Truth in our world tonight has no absolutes. Truth is truth when you believe it. And if it's not handy for you to believe it, it isn't truth, or it has no bearing on you. That's the post-modern world. Well, let me begin with a definition of the post-modern world. This comes from an author by the name of Stanley Grenz, a good scholar. He wrote a book entitled A Primer on Postmodernism. Here is how he defines Postmodernism. If you're ever confused about what this postmodernism is, listen to this definition. Postmodernism refers to an intellectual mood and an array of cultural expressions that call into question the ideals, principles, and values that lay at the heart of a modern mindset. That should help you some. Well, if that was no help to you, it was no help to me either. Here's the thing. Postmodernism is easier to describe than it is to define. You know, it's, I know what it is when I see it. So let me describe a world that is a postmodern world. You think about whether the things I'm describing are things you have seen in your own society. Here we go. In a postmodern world, there are no rules that are valid. The only rules that are valid are the ones I want to obey. So if I am not permitted to go down this street, but I want to get to the end of the street and it's a one-way coming toward me, I just go down because it's inconvenient for me to obey the rules. I'll only obey what rules that are good for me. That's a postmodern world. Secondly, in a postmodern world, only outward appearance is important. Only outward appearance is important. We live in a world that likes style over substance. And that affects the church as much as affects anything else. There is significant pressure on your pastor all the time to allow his messages to reflect style over substance. Well, in that world, there are lots of political spin doctors. You know, the, the government does something, and then somebody comes out and explains why it didn't sound like what everybody knew it did. And there's, we live in a soundbite world where you can't really get much. You get two, three words at a time, and that's it. 
And so much of preaching in the world today by those who are in the postmodern world is designed for the postmodern world, but it's afflicted with style over substance. Let me show you a third thing. The cardinal virtue in a postmodern world is tolerance. You and I are asked to tolerate everything. Even those things we know God says are forbidden for us. The world says, it's okay, there is no God anyway. You and I are asked to tolerate lifestyles that the Bible condemns. You and I are asked to tolerate religions that we know are pagan religions. We are asked to tolerate everything, even if it runs counter to our beliefs, even if it opposes God. If you don't tolerate it, you are a bigot. That's the postmodern world, friends. That's the world we live in. Here's another way you can know the postmodern world. In the postmodern world, you vilify the West, but you romanticize the East. Now, you and I live in the West. So, in a postmodern world, everything the Western world does is bad, everything the Eastern world does is good. So Winston Churchill is out, the Dalai Lama is in. There are churches across this island nation today that have more influence in the style of things they do in church that come right out of Hinduism and Buddhism than you and I would ever really believe. It's the spiritual smorgasbord a little of this, a little of that. Get some good style and people will come for it. That's postmodernism. That's the way the world is today. One more thing. In a postmodern world, you reject all authority. You empower the people to be the authority. And you said, no, wait a minute. Isn't that democracy? No, I'm not talking about democracy. I'm saying when people become the authority, there can be no person in charge of anything. I'll give you some examples. It's what I call the death of the expert. You know, um, I, I've spent a lot of my life in radio, and with somewhat amusement, I have watched radio move from where a person got on the airwaves, and as an expert, taught people or informed people or stirred up a discussion for people. But then something happened to radio. It became what we call talk radio. Now, talk radio is not bad in itself. It's just for people who have nothing to say. Now they have a place to say it. I mean, anybody can call in. And the minute you call in, you become an expert. Let me give you one example. There's a cardiologist invited by a talk radio program here in Kingston to come on the air and talk about lifestyle and diet and health and things like that and how to keep yourself from having a heart attack. And he, uh, he's educated and he's been in practice a long time and he's a very respected expert in his field. And he's on the radio explaining how you should live your life. And then they open the lines for people to call in. And somebody calls in and says, you know what? I stuck a soursop bean uh, up my nose, the seed, and I cured my own heart attack with that seed from a soursop. And that moron has the same weight in his argument as this trained physician does. Why? We live in a postmodern world where everybody is an expert on everything. Now, if this sounds like the world you live in, it's because it is the world you live in. We're living in the throes of postmodernism. Postmodernism is amoral to immoral, it is anti God, it is self 
self-serving. It is addicted to electronics. It is seeking to be spiritual, but not at all in the biblical sense of the word spirituality. So, what are we going to do? Well, that's where the Bible is so helpful for us, because the early church faced exactly the same situation. How did the early church respond to their world when their world was so anti-God, when their world was so amoral to immoral? How did they respond? By learning how this church that had such a dramatic impact on the world responded, you and I might get some clues as to how we should respond today. As far as I know, they had two options, the early church did. One was image, and the other was impact. It was style versus substance. Here's what they could do. Number one, they could accommodate the mind of their century so they could win that century to the Lord. And by that I mean they, they can allow those things uh, that have uh, no virtue, they can allow people to run their operations that had no concept of virtue, no relationship with God. They could have a world in which they would be squeezed into the mold of their world so that they could impact their world. They could accommodate their world. They could preach in a way so as not to make their society uncomfortable. They could figure out words that would be synonyms for sin, but not actually say sin, because people would be upset if you did. They could just love people and hope for the best. Now, we don't talk about sin today either because we don't want to offend people. It looks to me like the first century church didn't have a problem offending people. There is no long-term evidence anywhere that making the church a place for sinners to feel comfortable can win them to the Lord. They have to come to grips with their own sin in order to turn to Christ in salvation. And we don't do them any benefit by making them feel at home in church. You see, the church is not designed to make a place for sinners to feel comfortable in their sin. The church is designed to teach them to turn from their sin and trust Christ. So, if one method of addressing the problem of their world for the first century church was to accommodate the world, what is the other possibility, the second method? And it's this. Fortunately, the early church had another option. They could provide an alternative to their society. They could show their society that they were different they could show their society they had a better answer to the questions people were asking. They could show their society they had hope that the world did not have. That's called the alternative method as opposed to the accommodation method. Now, they could live in contrast to the Roman and Jewish world of the first century. Now, they could take a stand but love their enemies in the way they took that stand for Christ. They could let their society see Jesus as the only way to God, rather than make him one of the options people had to get to heaven when they died. They could do all that. So which do you think they chose to do? Well, clearly they did not choose method number one, accommodation, because they didn't accommodate anybody with anything. They chose to show the world something different. The passage that was read for our scripture this evening talks about Peter and the apostles saying to the authority, the religious authority, the Sanhedrin, when the Sanhedrin said, didn't we release you and charge you not to speak or teach in the name of that Jesus ever again? Peter and the apostles said, yes, you did, but 
we must obey God rather than men. That doesn't sound like accommodation to me. That's providing an alternative in the way you live your life so that the world has to wrestle with who you are rather than you wrestling with who the world is. That's what the church of the 21st century needs. We need to love our society in a way that doesn't mix what we are with our society because if we do, they'll never find their way to Christ. If we provide an alternative for them, I'll guarantee you that when it comes to matters of life or death, when it comes to matters where people are on their last legs in a hospital somewhere, they don't want to talk to someone who's going to accommodate them. They want to talk to someone who knows what they're talking about. They're going to want to talk to you. Now, what does that mean? Well, in the 21st century church, if we choose the alternative method, here's what it means for us. I want to suggest to you just several things that you can do to be an alternative to the postmodern world you live in. Number one, don't be afraid to be authoritative. Don't be afraid to be authoritative. You know, postmoderns don't like authority. But when it comes to knowing how to go to heaven, they want somebody who knows what they're talking about to talk to. You can be that authority. Don't be afraid to authoritatively say what John 14, 6 says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That is the most exclusivistic statement in any religion anywhere in the world. And if it's true, and we are wishy-washy on that statement, we have lost the opportunity to point this society to the only person who can save them from their sins. So don't be afraid to be authoritative. Let me just give you some examples in the Bible of people being authoritative, the Lord Jesus being among them. Matthew chapter 7, verse 29, the crowds came to Jesus, and here's what it says, because he taught as one who had authority. Matthew chapter 21, verse 23, Crowds came to Jesus, the chief priests and the elders asked, By what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? See, they understood the importance of authority. They just didn't like Jesus using it. Because they thought they were the authorities, and no one should question what they had to say. Listen to this. Acts chapter, in fact, let's not listen. Turn with me in your Bible to Acts chapter 17. I want you to see a part of the story of Paul when he's in Athens. And I want you to notice what this little apostle does when he gets in a position he has to either accommodate the world or provide an alternative to the world. Acts chapter 17, let's begin about verse 16. Now, just to bring you up to speed where we are in the middle of this chapter, Paul has been in Thessalonica. The Jews of Thessalonica ran him out of town, so he went to Berea. They came to Berea, ran him out of there, so he came all the way down to Athens, and he's waiting for Timothy and Silas to come to him at Athens. So at verse 16 it says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Listen, friends, when you start to witness for Christ authoritatively, there are always going to be th philosophers who want to debate with you. Do they know what they're talking about? Usually, no. They just like to talk. Paul ran into them here. Now, these were brainy Greeks. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? See, that's a derogatory remark. Others remarked, 
he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. That's an alternative to what they were hearing, not an accommodation. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where he said to them, May we know, where they said to him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. You are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. Now, does that sound like a combination by the Apostle Paul? No, he was providing an alternative to what they had already heard from the other philosophers. He was bringing to them the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, and he was bringing it to them authoritatively. How do I know that? Well, I can read. Let's read on. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. This is first century Facebook, right here. <laughs> they would go to the Areopagus called Mars Hill. Uh, some of you may have been to Athens and you've gone up on top of the uh, Acropolis and just down over the Acropolis is this bald hill. That's the Areopagus. That's where they took Paul in this chapter. And notice, all the Athenians and strangers who were scholarly types would go to this place and they'd sit down more or less in a circle and they would kind of bandy back and forth ideas, philosophies, their own personal philosophies. That's what it says here, verse 21. Look at verse 22. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I am going to proclaim to you. That, friends is not accommodation. That is not the trend of the 21st century church. That is the way the first century church impacted their world. Now here, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus. Remember, everybody sat in a circle and they bandied back ideas. As long as you sat in that circle, you sat as equals. But Paul knew that his message was not an equal to their message. Can you imagine this craggy little Jew standing up and speaking to them with authority, the authority of him standing over them and telling them of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? This man was speaking with authority, and I beg you, if you want to impact this society, this postmodern world we live in, you must be authoritative when it comes to Jesus Christ. He is not one option among many. He is the only way to God. Well, in Titus chapter 2, verse 15, Paul says to Titus, These are the things you should teach. Encourage and rebuke with all authority. Now, as you know, I have just uh, stepped down as the president of Back to the Bible. After 23 years of teaching God's Word on the air, God uh, moved in my heart to, uh, to take on a new challenge. Maybe sometime this week I'll tell you about what that new challenge is. But of the 23 years I was on the air, when I first got to Back to the Bible, we would average about 1,500 pieces of mail every day. Now remember, this is 1990. This is a long time ago. Over the course of these years, mail changed to email. Email changed to Facebook. Facebook changed to Twitter. Twitter changed to who knows what. 
So people text us today rather than write us a letter. But in all those letters, 1,500 pieces of mail every day, there would be some people who would be critical of the way we did things at Back to the Bible. Now think about this. There are some radio listeners in the world who do not like me. Go figure. A nice guy like me. And, and my secretary, who is a bit sensitive, my secretary was my secretary for 30 years, the poor woman. And she started to keep tabs of what it is people said they didn't like about me. Far and away, one thing stood out above all other things. People would say to me, you speak too authoritatively. Friends, I want you to know I don't have any authority at all. If I ever say something doesn't come out of this book, don't believe it. This is my authority. What we need today are preachers and people in the church who will not accommodate this world, but provide the alternative that Jesus Christ provides for this world. So don't be afraid to be authoritative. Secondly, I said there are several things I want you to think about tonight. Secondly, don't be afraid to live a godly life in an ungodly world. This is a hard thing to do. In the last letter the Apostle Paul ever wrote. He wrote it to young Timothy. It's 2 Timothy. I'm going to read just a few verses out of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, so I can get to the verse I really want you to hear. I'm going to start at verse 1 just to prepare you for it. He says to Timothy this, Mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now you see if any of this sounds like the society you live in tonight, okay? Just look at this. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. I mean, it's like I read today's Facebook posts to me, or today's newspaper, or turned on the TV and saw what's happening in Kingston, Jamaica today. This is our world. And again, I beg you, if you want to make an impact on this world, do not be afraid to live a godly life in an ungodly world. For this reason, I'm going to skip down to verse 11 and 12. Now, let me start at verse 10. It's his final charge to Timothy. He says this, You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience of love, endurance, persecution, sufferings. What kind of things happened to me at Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured. Yet, the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That is not good news, folks. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to change one word in the Bible? If I could change only one word in the Bible, I would change all who will live godly will suffer persecution to all who will live godly may suffer persecution. But in a world that accommodates its society, they never have persecution because they don't upset anybody. They welcome those who are sinners, not so, that, so much that they can provide an alternative to their life, but so they can bring them in and hopefully woo them to the Savior. 
Yet I don't see Paul doing that. I don't see Stephen, who was stoned for what he said, doing that. I don't see these godly people trying to live among ungodly people in a way that they hide their godliness. Jesus said, if the world hates you, it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. John 15, verse 18. See, today the goal of much of the church is to make everyone like us. Just make us popular. Make us everybody like me. That's image. However, the goal of Christ was not popularity, but godliness. That's impact. John said, do not be surprised, my brothers, if the world hates you. 1 John chapter 3, verse 13. Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. The word mark is the word in Greek, stigma. I bear in my life the stigma of being a disciple of the Lord Jesus. That doesn't sound like accommodation to me. That sounds like a man who, with all his heart, wanted to provide an alternative to a world that was going to hell. Today, we must feel like the Apostle Paul. He asked the question, is the offense of the cross cease? See, the cross was a stumbling stone. The philosophy today is remove all stumbling stones for people to come to the gospel. And in the process of moving the stumbling stone, they remove the cross. It's no wonder so much of the church of the 21st century has no impact on this century. Now look, I'm not talking about differences in denominations. I'm not saying if you're a small church, you're a good church, and if you're a large church, you're a bad church. Uh, Linda and I are members of a church that has three services every Sunday morning. I am saying, however, that you can't take out of the church things that cause the world to feel comfortable when they come in if the things you take out are the message that will bring them to Christ. So don't be afraid to live a godly life in an ungodly world. Finally, this last thing. I've encouraged you not to be afraid to be authoritative. I've encouraged you not to be afraid to live a godly life in an ungodly world. I also want to encourage you not to neglect to be thoroughly familiar with your Bible. This is a significant concern for me. For more than 35 years in my country, I have been battling a plague in America. It's the plague of Bible illiteracy among Christians. It would totally discourage you if statistically you know what I know about how many Christians read their Bibles. Now, look, the problem is not that we don't have a Bible. In fact, you may be familiar with the uh, Christian book distributors. They're a company in uh, Massachusetts that that, uh, sells a lot of books online, sells a lot of books through the mail. They send out catalogs every few months, and every year they send out a Bible catalog. So if you want to buy your favorite Bible, you can buy it from them. In the 2013 edition of the CBD Bible catalog, there were no less than 2,984 different choices. You could buy a red Bible, a black Bible, a blue Bible, a pink Bible. You could buy a couple's Bible, a single's Bible. You could buy the NIV, the KJV, the NASB, the DDT. Oh, no, that's not, that's something else. You, you could buy almost any kind of Bible imaginable, 2,984 choices. Now, listen to me carefully. We don't need more Bibles. 
We need to read the one we have. The problem is not the fact that most people in the West don't have a Bible. In fact, George Barna claims that in America, at least, most families, not Christians, most families own three different versions of the Bible, and all three of them have dust on them. You know, I've often said that if Christians blew the dust off their Bible all at the same time, we'd all get killed in a dust storm. Here's the bottom line, folks. Tonight we've been focusing on our world, what our world is like, and how the first century church impacted their world, what they did that maybe has waned some over the years in what we do today. And I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to be authoritative when you present the message of Jesus Christ to your friends. Be loving, be kind, but be authoritative. You have the words of eternal life. I want to encourage you not only to be authoritative, but I want to encourage you to live a godly life in this ungodly world. You know, people often would write to me or call me or whatever and say, uh, is it possible for me to say, have a good and godly day? You know, I hear you say that all the time. Can I say it as well? I said, well, I don't have a copyright on that. Sure, say it. But think about this. I started saying that because I was tired of people saying to me, have a good day. Have a good day. They didn't care if I had a good day or not. Just have a good day. <laughs> and I've got to be honest with you. I have a lot of days that aren't good days, don't you? But just because I don't have a good day doesn't mean I can't have a godly day. So have a good and godly day. Don't be afraid to live a godly life in an ungodly world. And don't be afraid to be thoroughly familiar with the Bible that is the revelation of the mind of God to the minds of men. Here's the bottom line. The early churches were not devoid of image. That is not to say they had impact, but no image. They did have an image. It was the image that the Roman world had of these churches, these followers of Jesus, if you will. And I got to tell you, the image was pretty negative. In fact, it was downright awful. Lucian, L-U-C-I-A-N. Lucian was uh, a rhetorician. He was a man who went around speaking and giving uh, talks and lectures. Over 80 works are attributed to this early, early rhetorician. Lucian thought the Christians of the first century were naive, and he thought they were unsophisticated. Well, many in today's church if they were thought to be naive and unsophisticated, would spend the rest of their budget trying to undo that perception of themselves. Lucian said, and I'm quoting from Lucian now, they, meaning the Christians, they scorn all possessions without distinction and they treat them as community property. They accept such things on faith alone without any evidence. So if a fraudulent or cunning person who knows how to take advantage of a situation comes among them, he can make himself rich in a short time. Lucian goes on to say, having convinced themselves that they are immortal and will live forever, these poor wretches despise death and yet most willingly give themselves to it. Lucian, who represents the society of the first century, can't believe what he sees in Christians. Why? Because these people did not accommodate their message to Lucian. They provided an alternative to the world that was on its way to hell without the Lord Jesus. That's exactly what the church of the 21st century has to do if we're going to have an impact on our society today. That's the image 
that the first century had about the first century church, and it's not a good image. Now look, don't go out of here and misquote me. I'm not suggesting you go out and make your church as obnoxious as you can possibly be. The people who attend already can do that. (laughs) No. What I am suggesting is this. And if you're 65 or older, you need to listen closely. Things are not going to be done in church the way they were when you and I were young. We can be bitter about that, or we can be sweet about that. I think the Lord would love us to be sweet about that. On the other hand, you may be the guard against accommodation in your church as opposed to providing an alternative to the world. So you all folks, you have a big job in church. The earliest churches were stunningly successful. I mean, absolutely successful. 3,000 here, 5,000 there. They were just growing by leaps and bounds, and people hated them. I don't want you to be hated. I just want you to be true to God's word. I want you to live a godly life. I want you to be authoritative in saying Jesus is the savior of this world. Hey, look, this world has many religions. Still has only one savior, just one. Many years ago, maybe 20 years ago now, Linda and I were visiting China for our first time. We flew into uh, Hong Kong, and we took the train up to Guangzhou into uh, what was then called mainland China, communist China. We were on our way there to see a man by the name of Samuel Lamb, L-A-M-B, like little sheep. You may know that name because Samuel Lamb was one of those house church pastors that was put into prison for many years just for being a pastor. Samuel had this little flat, I think on the second story, if I remember correctly. And because we thought it might be dangerous to Samuel for us just to walk up to the front door and knock and say, we're here. I mean, after all, our faces did not look at all like these Chinese people. We circumvented the front door, went around through an alley and around the back and on this side and over here. And finally, we ended up at the door and were greeted and let in. We went up to the second floor of the flat, and Samuel's flat had no furniture in it but benches. Every spot he had had a small wooden bench. No backs, just benches. Over in one corner, there was a kind of a barricade there, and behind that barricade, there was a hot plate on which Samuel's wife would prepare the meals for Samuel and his family. Samuel ate his rice while we chatted with him. He told me this story about his life. In fact, Zondervan Publishers once published a book about Samuel entitled Bold as a Lamb. Samuel said, I was pastoring this church in this location when one day there was a knock at our door during the service and the police came in and dragged me out and took me to prison. I think he said he was in prison seven years just for preaching the gospel. But while Samuel was in prison, the church went on. Others filled in for him. The word was understood. Their message was bold. They were authoritative in the way they presented it. And when Samuel was released from prison, he said to me, my church of 400 people when I went to jail was now 800 people when I got out of jail. So he began to preach some more. And very shortly, the police came another time to his door, hauled him off to prison, I think for 21 years years. And when Samuel finally was released because he was an old man and they thought he can't do any damage to us now, 
When Samuel was finally released and he went home, he found that church that had been 400 and suddenly was 800. It was up to 1,600 people now. And with a grin on his face and a little bit of a wryness in his voice, he looked at me and he said, I'm going to write a book on church growth. I said, you won't sell many copies in America, but go ahead. Listen, friends. Bold as a lamb. Impact comes from people who do not back down on the truth. You want the church of the 21st century to have an impact on the postmodern world? You want your church to have an impact in your community? Do what this church did. Be authoritative. Live a godly life. Whatever you do, make sure that you don't neglect the Word of God. Would you pray with me, please? Would you take just a moment quietly before I pray? I asked you earlier on to look around and think about the world you and I live in and see if any of the way I described a postmodern world applied to your world. I now ask you to look around the body of Christ and see if what we've described the body of Christ in the first century looks like the body of Christ in the 21st century. And if there are areas in which you feel that your church or the church at large here in Jamaica could use a little of God's assistance, would you just identify those areas in your mind right now? You're not being judgmental. You're not being critical. You're thinking about impact. Is the message given with authority? to the world, not just to the church, but to the world? Is godliness the cornerstone of your life as opposed to success or being popular or something else? And when was the last time you seriously read God's Word? I don't mean a verse or two today and a verse or two tomorrow. Have you ever read God's Word all the way through? Most Christians haven't, you know. In fact, sometimes the first of the year they make resolutions and they say, I'm going to read all of God's Word this year, and that lasts till almost the end of January. But you know what, folks? You can read the entire Bible in just 72 hours. That's all. Now, you may not want to sit down and read through 72 hours, but I'm telling you, reading all that God revealed to you is not that hard. It takes will. Do you have that will? Examine the world and examine your impact on that world. And commit to God right now in your heart what you think he would have you to do. Father, thank you for these dear people who have come tonight. Thank you for clearing the way in their schedule and clearing the way in the rain today and through work and through all the things that could have kept them away from you tonight. Lord, maybe you brought them here for a very specific purpose. Maybe there was something the Spirit of God used in what was said tonight that strikes a real responsive chord in their life. Lord, strum that chord. Make it vibrate in their heart and in their head. Help us, Lord, to be authoritative because we have the words of eternal life. Lord, help us to be godly. Help us to know what it's like to be like God and then live our lives like that. 
And Lord, help us, as the psalmist writes, not to forget your word. Give us, Lord, the opportunity. Give us, Lord, the will. Give us, Lord, everything we need to provide for this needy world an accommodation. But not an accommodation to the world. Help us, Lord, to present the gospel as an alternative so they must accommodate themselves to the Savior. Accept our thanks for what you will do in our lives tonight. In Jesus' name.